All right, happy Tuesday afternoon, and welcome to another video lecture. Uh, this is going to be about European imperialism, and I'll be honest with you, this is a big topic that I'm going to try to get into about 30 minutes, but some schools out there offer an entire semester class just on this one topic alone. So I'm going to do my best for you to keep this pretty simple. All right, Europe in the late 19th century, we moved on a little bit. Uh, in the last one third of the 1800s, Europe is going to control over 10 million square miles, over 150 million people. That is somewhere around 20% of all the world's land and over 10% of its population. Europe is going to control a lot of people. And there's still gonna be colonies. You're probably familiar with colonies in Africa, colonies in Asia. Uh, it's, European colonization is going to change. It's not going to be like it was in South America. It's not going to be like it was in North America, where it was all about taxing colonies and getting money. In the late 19th century, it's all going to be about control, controlling everything, controlling resources, controlling governments, controlling money, economics, everything. A big reason why this imperialism a lot a lot of the reason why this colonization is going to change is because Western science and Western culture is going to allow parts of the world that hadn't seen much European activity to be exploited. And very often Western science is going to leave these parts of the world even poorer than they were before because of stolen resources and stolen raw materials. There are a couple reasons for this new imperialism. Uh, we're in a post-industrial society now. So there's a need for new raw materials that were never needed before. Oil, rubber, both of those are going to be needed for new machinery and new technology. Colonies are no longer just seen as markets. Our old friend mercantilism, where everybody had the same piece of the pie that they were fighting over, that's not true anymore because a lot of the new colonies, they can't afford the finished products of Europe. In the American colonization period, raw materials were sent to England. England would make stuff and then sell it back to the British colonists here in America. But when we get to the late night, I'm sorry, the late 1800s, we don't do that anymore. Stuff is taken from Africa, stuff is taken from Asia turned into finished products and then sold to Europe instead of the colonies. There's also this need for control. European countries, they want to protect their investments and they think the best way they can do that is to control the source of the raw materials. So European countries will come in, they will seize control of an area, they'll control the politics, they'll control the economics to protect their interests in that part of the world. I also have to say overpopulation is not a reason. A lot of people think it is, but it really isn't. Um, very few Europeans settle in their colonies. I've done a lot of study on colonial Vietnam, and there are almost no French that go to Vietnam. Th same thing's going to be true in British Africa or in the Belgian Congo the very, very smallest number of Europeans go to the colonies. Most of the, quote, extra Europeans go to North America, South America, or Australia. Between the years 1875 and 1914, there are 36 million Europeans who emigrate, leave Europe, and somewhere around 25 million of them come to the United States. And believe it or not, France actually has the second most immigrants during this time period of any other country in the world. Um, so overpopulation, sending people to colonies is not what's happening at all. Now, continuing with our reasons for imperialism, medicine. Modern medicine is beginning. Uh, they still don't have antibiotics or anything like that. That's going to come right around World War II. But there is modern medicine that's making it easier to go to tropical places. There are now immunizations against typhoid. Uh, they know how to rehydrate from cholera. And there's something called Ipecac that prevents dysentery, prevents you from having so much diarrhea that you die. All three of these 
diseases being treated decreased the mortality rates by 80%. Before we could treat for typhoid, cholera, or dysentery, eight out of every 10 Europeans who went to Africa died. Now it's only two out of 10. Still a lot of deaths, but a lot less than before. Uh, there are problems with worm-based or protozoa-based conditions just because you can't be immune to that stuff. A great modern day example of a worm-based condition is guinea worm. And the Carter Center and former president Jimmy Carter is trying to help eradicate the cases of guinea worm. If you want to see some gross stuff, look up guinea worm uh, on YouTube or on Google. All right, moving on. National prestige is a big reason for imperialism. The idea of owning colonies excited people in European countries. It gave them something to look towards. Uh, think of it like, yay, look, we're important because we have a colony. And people were taking colonies just to take colonies. A great example of this is Germany. Germany ends up taking German Southwest Africa. They end up taking a place called Namib Namibia. Uh, neither one of them have any economic significance. In fact, German Southwest Africa is nothing but a desert. But the people of Germany were so enthralled with the idea of owning a colony, they thought it was so important, so exciting, that Germany just went and planted its flag in the middle of the desert and said, this is ours now. Uh, the last big reason for imperialism during the late 1800s is class conflict. If you go and colonize another place, it distracted from class conflicts at home. And it made people kind of ignore the bad stuff that was happening in their countries for at least a little while. There are many different imperial rivalries that are going to come out of this. And I'm just going to focus on one, really, because I could go on and on about this. But Britain and Russia is probably the biggest one. It starts with the Crimean War we talked about last week that goes from 1853 until 1856. Originally, it was between the Ottoman Empire and Russia, but Britain gets involved because they want to stop Russian influence in the Mediterranean Sea. So Britain's going to take over Egypt so that they can control the Suez Canal. Britain is going to support Greece in their bid for independence from the Ottoman Empire. And in response to that, Russia is going to help support the country of Serbia. They're going to help Serbia come up with this idea of creating a country called Yugoslavia, which is also the Union of Slavs. And Russia ends up being seen as kind of like the big brother of the Serbian people and the Slavic people. Now, this rivalry continues from 1853 all the way up until 1907. And the only reason Britain and Russia put their hatred for each other to the side is because Germany scares both countries so much. Another very, very famous part of this imperialism is known as the scramble for Africa. Here's a picture of Africa showing how much Africa changes. On the left-hand side, you have Africa in 1880. You can see Basically, you only, you have like three colonies, four colonies, really. You've got Egypt that belonged to the Ottoman Empire. You've got Algeria that belonged to France. Senegal belonged to France. A couple other small co colonies here, but nothing crazy. But if you look on the right, this is 1913. This is how the Europeans carved Africa up. Now, for today's lecture, the reading for the class is the Congress of, or the Conference of Berlin and what happens there. The map on the right is the end result of the Conference of Berlin. It's the scramble for Africa, where countries just try to plant their flag in Africa and claim it as theirs. Now, let me take a quick break here. The secret word for today is the word rain because it is raining outside. Also, remember, there are two secret words, one on Tuesday, one on Thursday. The secret word quiz will open up on Thursday. The secret word quiz, you have to have both secret words to get credit. So today's secret word, once again, is 
reign. All right, moving on. Imperialism in Africa. Bet you never guessed I was going to talk about that after seeing that map. In 1875, European nations, they only controlled 10% of Africa, but by 1900, that number is up to 90%. It takes 25 years for European nations to control all of Africa, except for basically Ethiopia. Why? Why do they do this? It's an economic gold mine. Africa has diamonds, rubber, oil, coffee, actual gold. And European countries want to take all of those raw materials and all those resources for themselves. Now, the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, remember, that's to today's reading. Uh, most of the Western nations, including the United States, meet in the city of Berlin to carve up Europe, or carve up Africa, I should say, and decide who would get what parts of Africa. And it was established, basically, just to simplify the reading, that whoever could score the most treaties with local leaders and convince those local leaders to fly their European flag that country gets control of the territory and they use pretty dirty underhanded nasty tactics to get local leaders to support those european countries european countries they didn't care about rival ethnic groups they didn't care about tribal division they didn't care about enemies they just wanted to control land the borders were just arbitrarily drawn. The borders were just lines on a map. The European countries didn't care about the people that actually lived within those borders. And that's going to become a big deal after World War II when colonization ends. And it's still a big deal today even. Wars in Africa are still happening today as a result of this African imperialism. Now, what are the overall results of this? Well, European governments take advantage of the local African political groups. It's estimated that before colonization of Africa, there were over 10,000 independent political entities, possibly more. And the European governments took all those entities and just made big colonies and ignored what the local government systems were. Uh, they imported Indians, and Syrians to Africa to serve as colonial administrators. So people from Europe didn't really even monitor in their own affairs. You would have a couple of European officials in the colony, but most of the work is gonna be done by basically hired help. They don't even hire local African people to do the work. They bring in people from India and Syria to control the African colonies. The African economies were generally advanced. Sorry about the misspelling there. But African economies were generally advanced. There were some advances done in the economics and in the, the economic systems. But most of the benefits of these advances went to Europe and did not stay in Africa. The European countries, they expropriated both the lands and the goods of the African people and used them however Europe could benefit without thinking of the local African people. And then, if that's not enough, when European governments start to pull out of the African colonies, they basically just leave overnight. A great example of this is Belgium and the Congo. Belgium for a lack of better words and for simplicity's sake, they just leave overnight and uh, there's a power vacuum and a mess in the Congo that leads into a huge civil war, a couple of deaths and assassinations, and the Congo today still has problems because of what Belgium did there. Now, another big topic is British imperialism in India. India has a slightly different fate than Africa does. It's still not a great fate, but it is different. And for, Af uh, for sorry, India, we have to talk about something called the English East India Company, also referred to as the EIC. The English East India Company, it becomes the primary European force in India by 1600. 
Remember Vasco da Gama, he finds the first all water route to India in 1498, and it takes about 100 years before England is the dominant force in India. A great example of this, in 1647, the East India Company has 27 trading posts all over the coast of India. The, fresh, the French East India Company has one trading post near a place called Pondicherry. The dust the Dutch East India Company, they've got about five trading posts. By far, the English East India Company has the most powerful. Now, in the early 1700s, Muslim groups and Hindu groups would begin fighting each other for control of kingdoms in India. Britain and France, they are very opportunistic and they decide to exploit this conflict for their own advantage, hoping to throw the other European country out. So India is going to become kind of a proxy war between Britain and France. Now, one very famous thing that happens during this war between Muslims and Hindus, France and England, uh, France and Britain are going to make India one of the places where the Seven Years' War is fought. Here in the United States, if you remember, the Seven Years' War is better known than the French and Indian War. And when we talked about it, I mentioned it's really the first global war. Part of it happens in India. The French support the Muslims. The British support the Hindus. And there's this Muslim prince who's supported by the French government who captures the British-held city of Calcutta. In the city of Calcutta, there's 146 British civilians who are taken prisoner. They're tossed into basically a dungeon that's 20 by 20. Uh, and the average bedroom today is almost 20 by 20. So if you are happy to be watching this in your bedroom, just think of a room that's not much bigger than that. Only two small windows, and they're putting 146 people in this little room. By the morning, there are only 23 of the 146 civilians alive. Everybody else has died from their wounds or died from suffocation. Well, there are 3,000 British soldiers who get into Calcutta, and they're members of the EIC's private army. They're not even British army soldiers. The EIC has its own private army. They invade Calcutta. They defeat an army of 50,000 Indian soldiers. Now, in the end, uh, spoiler alert, France loses the Seven Years' War. We should already know that. France is forced to turn over all of their Indian possessions to Britain as part of the Treaty of Paris, 1763. Now, the EIC is allowed to create its own government. The British government in India is initially not a British government. It's a government controlled and owned by one company. And this government has one goal because it is a government run by the company and the company wants to make a profit. This government operates outside the British government. This government operates without any oversight from the British government. This would be like if Microsoft today owned its own country and did whatever it wanted to. Or if Comcast owned its own country and did whatever it wanted to. That's the same comparison to what was going on in England and in India. Well, in 1784, the India Act is passed, and for the first time, the British government in India is placed under control of Parliament. And a guy you've heard of before, Lord Cornwallis, the one who surrendered to George Washington during the American Revolution, his next gig his retirement after losing the American colonies is to be named the first governor general of India. He's going to set up a court system and a civil service system that are set using the British model. And people start to see India as a potential equal to Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain is going to look at India more favorably. Great Britain is going to treat India almost as an equal, which is something they never do in Africa. The British citizens start to feel it's their job to, to uh, their responsibility to civilize the people of India. And there's a very famous poem you may have heard of before by Rudyard Kipling called The White Man's Burden. And that's where that comes from, the idea that the British people have to civilize 
these savages in India and make them equal to the British population. Another very important thing that happens while Britain controls India is the Sepoy Rebellion. In 1857, the British government introduces something called the Enfield Rifle into the Indian Army. Uh, there would be these little packages, these cartridges, if you will, of gunpowder. You were supposed to tear off the top of the gunpowder, load it into the rifle, then load in your bullet, and then shoot. Well, the soldiers at the time, they were taught to take this cartridge that had grease on it, bite off the top of it because it was quicker, and then pour the gunpowder into their rifle. Uh, they did that so you could keep both hands on the gun at all times, and it increased loading time so you could shoot more bullets. Well, a rumor began that the grease on these cartridges came from both cows and pigs. Hindus saw cows as sacred. Muslims can't eat pork. So because this rumor starts at cows and pigs, grease from those two animals were used on the cartridges full of gunpowder, Hindu soldiers and Muslim soldiers serving in the British army there in India refused to load their weapons. Many of these soldiers were tried for insubordination and many of these soldiers were tossed into prison by the British government. Well, what happens is on May 10th of 1857, three divisions of the Sepoy army that were located in the city of Delhi, that's D-E-L-H-I, they're going to revolt against the British army. They're going to go to the prison. They're going to free a bunch of the prisoners, and they're going to guarantee 400 British citizens their safety they're going to say okay we're going to allow you to leave the city but once outside the city these 400 british citizens who were guaranteed their safety they're massacred and only four british citizens are left alive to tell the tale um, it's going to take over forty thousand british soldiers over a year to put this rebellion down now, after the Sepoy Rebellion is over, the people of Britain, they have a really big problem with this, and they're going to blame the East India Company for everything. And the British people are going to pressure Parliament to pass a law, and they do so, and this is called an Act for the Better Government of India. The EIC, the East India Company, the East India Trading Company, one of the most powerful companies that have ever existed in the history of the world is abolished. It is put out of business because of the way it treated India. All governing rights were given to the crown. Uh, Queen Victoria becomes the empress of India. Any lands that were illegally taken by the EIC are returned to Indian owners and Indian princes. And as late as 1870, there were 560 so-called independent princes. Uh, they were supposed to have control of all their local affairs, but really they didn't because they owed their allegiance to the British and the British controlled all the national affairs. It's kind of like saying that yeah, you have your own city here in, in Georgia, but really you don't because the governor controls everything. Now, once the British government is going to take control of everything, there's going to be this program of rapid modernization. Uh, railroads are going to be brought to India. The telegraph is going to be brought to India. And a fairly modern postal service is going to be brought to India. There's going to be industrialization brought to India. And most of the industrialization is going to be centered around the cotton trade. And the reason the British want Indian cotton is because of the Civil War. And speaking English becomes commonplace during this time. Uh, speaking English becomes a sign of wealth, a sign of education. Students are taught in Western style schools. They learn Western style science and they learn Western style history. Also, English style court systems and English style justice, a lot of people in India expected fair treatment, 
but they are still treated as second-class citizens. But overall, imperialism in India, it's a much different treatment than what happens in Africa. The people of India are much cl more closely treated as equals than the people of Africa ever were. Okay, so that is today's lecture. Uh, remember that there is a secret word in both this lecture and the one that's going to be on Thursday. I'm going to open up the quiz on the Berlin conference later today. Both this quiz and the quiz for Thursday and the secret word quiz are all due by Sunday night at midnight. You may have also noticed on the course calendar that there is no spring break anymore. The school has decided to take that away. Sorry, that decision was above my head. Uh, however, if you think about it, it really doesn't matter very, very much because you can't go anywhere. Everything is shut down and you're going to be working from home. So I do apologize for that, but I can't do anything about it. Uh, also, don't forget, you can always join me for virtual office hours. I am on Discord pretty much all the time because I have it on my phone. So um, until next time, we will see you later. Bye-bye.